The Frankfurt School in Fascism by Lars Fischer. On May 9, 1945, one day after VE Day, Theodore W. Adorno, who was in Los Angeles, wrote to, Mar to Max Horkheimer, who was in New York. I feel the need, he explained, to send you a few lines today, even though I have no pragmatic reason to do so, simply because it is a pity that we have not experienced the demise of the Nazis together. Hitler's regime has, after all, been the immediate cause of all the external developments in our lives for the last 12 years, and the expectation that things might change has been one of the decisive forces that have kept us alive. Conversely, the fact that our two lives have become conjoined is inextricably linked to fascism. Due to this phase, due to this phase good fortune and misfortune have become indissolubly entangled for us. The centrality of fascism in general and National Socialism in particular to the Frankfurt School's evolution that Adorno stressed so clearly in this letter is obvious enough. It needs to be historicized in an appropriate manner though. The dealings of the Frankfurt School with National Socialism were indeed immediate and they were, in the first instance, of an empirical and practical nature. Much as the members of the Frankfurt School and their associates sought to develop a conceptual understanding of fascism in general, and National Socialism in particular, as significant political movements and regimes whose policies and crimes they witnessed, this was a rather different undertaking from subsequent and current attempts to develop some sort of definitive, succinct, and yet all-encompassing definition of fascism and or National Socialism. To be sure, their concept of fascism doubtless became rather too inclusive in the course of the war. Even so, at the time, the task of identifying who or what was fascist was, for the most part, not one of the principal challenges faced by Horkheimer or Dorno and their colleagues and associates because they lived in a world in which fascists and their supporters, for the most part, proudly professed their own fascism in all too inescapable a way. Um, for all that fascism was generally rather more hesitant to speak its name after 1945, evidence for the afterlife of National Socialism in post-war Germany, too, was so palpable and abundant that it could be identified without any great finesse. The critical theorists' assessments of fascism were heavily conceptual because they assumed that all descriptive work needed to be inherently conceptual to be of any genuine use, not because they assumed they were in the process of analytically isolating some unique category called fascism. They in any case focused most of their descriptive and conceptual work on fascism, on German National Socialism, occasional cross-references to Italy or to international fascism notwithstanding. The discussion of fascism among the members and associates of the Frankfurt School comprised a variety of positions, and although Horkheimer and Adorno sided with Frederick Pollock's concept of state capitalism, no one official stance ever emerged. I will discuss the one rather improbable text that arguably comes closest to formulating an official position on the topic in some detail later. Indeed, at least in terms of their prognosis, even Horkheimer and Adorno did not see entirely eye to eye, as the latter noted in his letter of May 9th, 1945. As usual, when we disagree, it has turned out that we were both right. My bourgeois thesis that Hitler could not last has come true, albeit with a delay that makes it ironic. In other words, the forces of production of the economically more advanced countries proved stronger than the technological and terrorist spearhead of the latecomer. The war following the overall historical trend has been won by industry against the military. Yet your thesis about the historical force of fascism is also true, except that this force, like the embourgeoisement of Europe following Napoleon's fall, has moved its abode. Technically speaking, the German attempt to come to an understanding with the West at Russia's expense has failed, but it was inspired by the world spirit. 
the conflict between the two absolute tickets from which there will be there will no longer be any escape is clearly looming. I will return to Horkheimer and Adorno's notion of ticket mentality and their take on the fate of fascism after 1945 towards the end of this chapter. What all the contributions to the debates among the members and associates of the Frankfurt School had in common, however, was the fact that they were meant to serve one purpose before all others to facilitate the most effective possible opposition to Nazi Germany and its fascist allies. This desire was to varying degrees complicated by the fact that for all those involved, the distinction between fascism in particular and capitalism in general was ultimately one not of kind, but of degree. Fascism has only revealed what was already inherent in liberalism. Yet this by no means prevented most of the members of the Frankfurt School from actively supporting the U.S. war effort with their expertise, and with Horkheimer's unreserved encouragement. To be sure, given the Institute's dwindling finances, he was also relieved that some of its members were able to secure employment elsewhere, but it is quite clear that Horkheimer wholeheartedly endorsed their activities anyway. As is now well documented, from 1942 onwards, Franz Neumann, Herbert Marcuse, Otto Kirchheimer, Leo Lowenthal, and Arkadij Gerland worked in various capacities for the Office of War Information, the OWI, and the Research and Analysis Branch, RNA, of the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. Pollock acted as a consultant for the Justice Department and participated in discussions about post-war European reconstruction under the auspices of Eleanor Roosevelt, and Adorno too co-authored at least two memoranda with Marcuse for circulation in Washington. Newman rose to deputy head and eventually acting head of the RNA Central European Section. Marcuse joined him there and was widely respected as the leading analyst on Germany. Raphael Ladani has argued that the RNA Central European section produced a cohesive interpretation of the Nazi enemy with a clear Frankfurt imprint, though he also concedes that Newman and his colleagues nearly always lost the political battles they provoked inside the American administration. As the war drew to a close, they played a crucial role in putting together a handbook on Nazi Germany and civil affairs guides for the War Department's Civil Affairs Division, and Marcuse drew up a list of entrepreneurs and economic officials who, despite not being members of the Nazi party or apparatus, had played an essential role in Nazi Germany. Newman eventually traveled to London, where he headed up a special research group on war crimes and worked with Robert H. Jackson, the U.S. Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg, in this capacity, he evidently pushed his spearhead theory of anti-Semitism so success successfully that it was adopted by Jackson, which helps explain why the Shoah played such a relatively subordinate role at Nuremberg. In other respects, his suggestions were repeatedly ignored, however, and Newman resigned only days after the main trial opened. There's a certain irony to Newman's career in the OSS, given that he had initially warned against undue identification with the United States. In his preface to the state socialism issue of the studies in philosophy and social science, on which more later, Horkheimer wrote, the unprecedented, the unprecedented governmental power necessarily associated with state capitalism is now in the hands of a democratic and humanitarian administration. He then went on to stress the importance of ensuring it stayed there and the difficulties this was likely to entail. Commenting on a draft version of the preface, Newman wrote, It goes without saying that I disagree with your positive assessment of American democracy, but I am happy to drop my objection, given the political situation. It is, in, it is indicative of the complications that arose from the contention that fascism in particular and capitalism in general differed not in kind but by degree that Adorno took issue with the same passage, albeit precisely with the oppos opposite motivation, 
given Horkheimer's evident skepticism about the viability of a democratic form of state capitalism, the statement that the current democratic and humanitarian administration already held the unprecedented governmental power necessarily associated with state capitalism in its hands might well be understood as a veiled attack on the Roosevelt administration. Ambiguities of this kind were also reflected in the terminology deployed by Horkheimer and his colleagues and associates in their grappling with fascism. The terms fascism, national socialism, state capitalism, authoritarianism, and, and totalitarianism were occasionally contrasted, but most of the time they were used more or less interchangeably. State capitalism, to some extent, was the odd one out insofar as we do find the occasional vague hint at the possibility, more precisely perhaps, at the desperate hope, that it might also be able to exist in a democratic, non-totalitarian guise. In part, this relatively loose use of terminology reflected a genuine double bind that invariably arises if one insists, as one should, that fascism in general and National Socialism in particular were ultimately not fundamental aberrations from the course of Western history, but a logical consequence of certain potentially problematic elements integral to that history. Fascism and non-fascism, far from being radically distinct entities, are thus placed on a continuum, and the crucial question then concerns the transition, the qualitative leap, from a non-fascist state of affairs in which the potential for fascism nevertheless inheres to a fascist state of affairs in which, in turn, many of the characteristics of the non-fascist state of affairs are still present and yet take on a radically differing or different meaning. With the benefit of hindsight, it is evident that the relatively loose use of terminology also reflected erroneous assumptions on the part of the Frankfurt School about the overarching socio-economic processes that were encountering, or that they were encountering, and which they saw at the time as leading inexorably to only one possible outcome, which they identified fundamentally with fascism. Yet the critical theorists' concepts need to be judged not against current insight, but against the backdrop of the convulsions of the first half of the 20th century. That capitalism underwent massive changes and experienced a profound crisis at the time is obviously undeniable. Across the board, be it in the United States, in Europe, or the Soviet Union, industrial production was subject to a previously unimaginable degree of centralization, streamlining, and state intervention, leading to an equally unprecedented regimentation and functionalization of labor. From the perspective of the 1930s and 1940s, this economic regimentation was largely matched by ever more crass forms of political and cultural regimentation, which eventually played out against the backdrop of a previously unimaginable measure of destruction and barbarism. The apocalyptical account of an inexorable descent into a fascist, national socialist, authoritarian, totalitarian hell on earth, which the Frankfurt School offered in the 1940s, may seem too teleological, monodirectional, and all-encompassing with the benefit of hindsight. And yet, to want to accuse the Frankfurt School of undue alarmism seems an odd conceit against the backdrop of increasing repression and terror, the danger and then reality of the Second World War, and especially the Shoah not yet in its capacity as conceptual putty, but as an ongoing, unfolding, seemingly indeterminable genocide. When all is said and done, however, the Frankfurt School's relatively loose use of terminology was also just that, loose. Or, to be more precise, it was indicative of the overlap of a number of conceptual concerns that, certainly for Horkheimer and Adorno, were ultimately complementary yet competed with one another as they sought to work them out. I repeat, it is important to remember that many of the questions that continue to preoccupy scholars of fascism to this day were, for Horkheimer, Adorno, and their colleagues and associates, of immediate practical import. That fascism differed in possibly decisive ways from what went before was inescapable, 
yet neither could one reasonably claim that it had nothing in common with the order it replaced. Was fascism then ultimately more of the same in a more extreme form, or was it a qualitatively distinct phenomenon? Was fascism ultimately created and determined by economic necessity, or had fascism submitted the economy to its own political ends, or was it in the process of doing so? Given, it, given its extreme, violent, and rapacious nature, was fascism inherently unstable and set to implode of its own accord in a relatively prompt fashion, or did it represent a new order that could be sustained indefinitely, or at least for the foreseeable future? As we will see, the question of fascism's potential to remain stable in the, in the long run was a major preoccupation for the critical theorists. The explanation for this is simple enough. Any suggestion of its acute instability might have been taken to mean the fa that fascism was a problem that would resolve itself in fairly short order, and or whose implosion might yet precipitate a successful proletarian revolution in Central Europe. Assuming fascism was indicative of a new developmental phase of capitalism, was this new form of capitalism inevitable and or irrevocable? If fascism was a form of state capitalism and state capitalism was the newest form of capitalism, could this new form of capitalism also take on a democratic guise? Or was fascism the only mode of, so of association that it allowed for? And what exactly did that mode of association entail? And if fascism did represent the newest developmental phase of capitalism, would it be possible to defeat fascism without also overcoming capitalism? In response to these and a host of attendant questions, the critical theorists deployed a range of conceptual approaches, including the state capitalism concept. The racket theory, the evolving conceptual frameworks of the integrative force of the culture industry, the dialectic of enlightenment in the administered world, and far from least and closely connected to all of these, the core contention Adorno formulated in 1940 as follows. If it is true that one can understand anti-Semitism only if one understands National Socialism, then it must be equally true that one can understand National Socialism only if one understands anti-Semitism. As we will see, contrary to the widely accepted narrative, Horkheimer and Adorno were in fact quite selective in their endorsement of Pollock's concept of state capitalism. Clearly, though, Pollock's emphasis on the elimination of the sphere of circulation in state capitalism re resonated strongly with them, and it is hard to resist the impression that this was so because it allowed them to hang their conceptualization of anti-Semitism rather neatly to their minds on a materialist and empirical hook. As Adorno had written to his parents in February 1940, fascism in Germany, which is inextricably linked to anti-Semitism, represents a universal tendency with an economic foundation, which you yourself, dear W.K., i.e. Adorno's father, Oscar Weisengrund, recognized fairly early on, namely the demise of the sphere of circulation. The ongoing attachment to this notion is indicated not least by the prominent role this particular element of anti-Semitism continued to play in their discussions, even as their much more broadly contextualized work on dialectic of, en of enlightenment progressed apace. The Frankfurt School grappling with fascism per se, then, was, for the most part, pragmatic, pragmatic in nature, on the one hand, and ultimately subsumed under more wide-ranging conceptual concerns on the other. This was also reflected in Adorno's letter to Horkheimer of May 9, 1945. Having just emphasized how central the role fascism had played in their lives, Adorno promptly added, it is remarkable that life nevertheless takes on so much momentum of its own that one becomes quite oblivious to this reason. Much as the bet on which his fortunes hinged is forgotten, in the course of Faust's long existence. Only Mephistopheles perfunctorily and hastily thinks of it again at the end, yet it no longer bears any genuine meaning for the life which has become autonomous. Chapter 2
texts. The final two issues of the Zeitschrift for Social... F oh my god. Now study... I don't... I can't pronounce it in German. Now Studies in Philosophy and Social Science, Volume 9, Numbers 2 and 3, form the crucial focal point of the Frankfurt School's contem contemporaneous grappling with fascism. Adorno expressly referred to the first of these as the state socialism issue. It contained the following essays. Uh, state Capitalism by Pollock. Uh, Technological Trends and Economic Structure under National Socialism by Gerland. Changes in the Structure of Political Compromise by Kirk Kirchheimer. And Art and Mass Culture by Horkheimer. And Spengler Today by Adorno. The journal's final issue drew in part on a lecture series delivered by Institute colleagues at Columbia University in November and December 1941. The lectures were a State and Individual under National Socialism by Mark Hughes, Private Property under National Socialism by Gerland, The New Rulers in Germany by Newman, The Legal Order under National Socialism by Kirchheimer, and Is National Socialism a New Order by Pollock. The lineup of the issue, which came out towards the end of May 1942, was as follows. The End of Reason by Horkheimer, v Veblen's Attack on Culture by Adorno, Some Social Implications of Modern Technology by Marcuse, Is National Socialism a New Order by Pollock, and The Legal Order of National Socialism by Kirchheimer. Presumably, Newman's lecture was omitted due to its overlap with the relevant discussion in his Behemoth, the first edition of which came out just before the final issue of the journal. In addition to these two journal issues in Newman's Behemoth, further key texts were uh, The Jews in Europe by Horkheimer, uh, Authoritarian State by Horkheimer, um, which was originally written in 1940, with what would become the state socialism issue of the studies in mind. In the event, it appeared in the Mimographed Memorial Publication for Walter Benjamin, published by the Institute in 1942. And then Horkheimer's text on the sociology of class relations and Adorno's corresponding reflex, uh, reflections on class theory. <clears throat> All nine volumes of the journal or its studies in philosophy and social science, and with them, most of these texts are now readily available online. Newman's Behemoth has, consistent, has consistently been widely circulated and repeatedly reissued, and diehard scholars of critical theory can even access all five drafts of Horkheimer's Sociology of Class Relations online among the di digitized holdings of the Horkheimer Archive in Frankfurt. Consequently, the debate reflected in these texts can easily be reviewed by anyone whose interests go beyond the aspects I can reasonably discuss in this chapter. Helmut Dubiel and Alphonse Solner published a German language selection of these texts in 1981, focusing specifically on analyses of the national socialist economy, law, and state. While a selection obviously needs to be selective, Horkheimer and Adorno would surely have been deeply resentful of this separation of the more obviously political and economic contributions from those that were prima facie, more feuilletonistic in character, insistent as they were that the analysis of a single work of art can lead more deeply into the inner structure of society than the most elaborate questionnaire with a giant apparatus for investigation and with tremendous statistical results. State Socialism It is generally accepted that a fundamental divide ran through the Frankfurt School in the late 1930s and early 1940s in terms of their understanding of the nexus between fascism and capitalism. This controversy pitted Newman, Gerland, and Kirchheimer on the one hand against Pollock, Horkheimer, and Adorno on the other. On Pollock's account, fascism corresponded to a new qualitative distinct phase or qualitatively distinct phase of capitalism, that of state capitalism in its totalitarian guise. Though as already indicated, he had relatively little to say about its potential non-totalitarian counterpart, democratic state socialist or er, 
state capitalism. The chief feature of state capitalism was the redundancy of the market whose functions had been resumed by the political sphere. That political sphere in turn now consisted of a range of competing rackets. While Pollock thus insisted on the primacy of pol politics in state capitalism, and Horkheimer and Adorno endorsed his position, Newman, Gerland, and Kurtheimer continued to insist on the primacy of economic factors in understanding the dynamics at work in Nazi Germany. It is no coincidence that this disagreement mapped neatly onto the assessment of the significance of anti-Semitism. While Adorno and Horkheimer insisted on the centrality of anti-Semitism to National Socialism and linked it to the ostensible demise of the sphere of circulation supposedly characteristic of state capitalism, Newman maintained that one can offer an account of National Socialism without attributing a central role to the Jewish problem. Yet while all this is certainly the truth and nothing but the truth, it is anything but the whole truth. To what extent Horkheimer and Adorno genuinely, sub genuinely subscribe to Pollock's conceptualization of state capitalism is, as already indicated, a rather moot point. While generally full of praise, Horkheimer had already expressed certain reservations about Pollock's outline for the essay that was going to open the state capitalism issue of the studies. He had two principal reservations. Firstly, he feared that the portrayal of state capitalism, including its totalitarian variant, i.e. fascism, as the logical and ultimately inevitable contemporary guise of capitalism, could be understood as an expression of partisanship for totalitarian state capitalism, a concern he re reiterated on reading a draft of the essay itself. That this was an ongoing issue for Horkheimer is demonstrated by the fact that he also raised it in the context of his harsh critique of Henrik Grossman. Grossman, Horkheimer suggested, was being Hegelian in that he subscribed to Hegel's crucial mistake, which had lean in his confusing theory and justification. Do you really think, he asked Grossman rhetorically, that the objective necessity of fascism, which draws all the currents of late capitalism into itself like a vortex, cannot be demonstrated just as easily as that of all the previous phases, perhaps even more so. A second more general worry was that Pollock's account was, by Horkheimer's and Adorno's standards, insufficiently dialectical. In his outline under the final heading, End of the Economic Era, Pollock had suggested a scheme of thesis, feudalism, antithesis, private capitalism, and synthesis, state capitalism. To Horkheimer's mind, the conceptualization underlying this scheme was still extremely shaky. After all, it was certain aspects of imperial Germany, not fascism, that seemed like a sort of synthesis between feudalism and private capitalism. He also expressed his unease at Pollock's contention that, in the new state capitalist state, the seemingly independent institutions, namely party and economy, are only its specialized arms. Party and economy, their coordination with and is, pre is presumably, presumably just an oversight, are not just slaves, but just as much masters, or rather the means shape those who deploy them. And by economy, I don't mean just the laws of the market under liberalism, and by party, not just the hierarchical form, but also the interests that assert themselves within it. Having been asked by Pollock to comment on a draft of the article itself, Adorno was highly alarmed. As he explained to Horkheimer, the critical suggestions he had made to Pollock could deal only with details and questions of presentation, and it would have been simply impossible to alert him to the actual extent of my concerns. Impossible first, because as a non-economist, I do not have the authority required to present those concerns, but also second, because it would have been psychologically irresponsible of me to articulate a critique genuinely reflecting my point of view. I can best summarize my concerns about this essay by saying that it represents an inversion of Kafka. Kafka presented the hierarchy of the office as hell. Here, hell turns into a hierarchy of the office. Moreover, the whole thing is so, th so thetical 
and it is written to such an extent in the Husserlian sense from above that it lacks all conviction, not to mention the undialectical assumption that a non-antagonistic economy can exist within an antagonistic society. I anticipate a genuinely apparatic situation. If the essay comes out in this or a similar form, it will only harm the reputation of the Institute, and above all, Fritz's own reputation, and unleash sardonic howls of triumph from the lows. Newman's E. Tutti Quanti. On the other hand, it would be a grave setback for the state socialism issue if it were not published. His own essay on Spengler only works as a philosophical link to the problem of state capitalism, Adorno added, clearly demonstrating the integral connection Horkheimer and Adorno envisaged between the political and feuilletonistic contributions in the journal, but it was far too modest to carry such an aspirational issue. The only solution Adorno suggested would be for Horkheimer to rewrite Pollock's essay in a manner combining it with the motifs in in your state capitalism. After all, the central motifs in Pollock's texts obviously originate in your essay, but they have been simplified and de-dialecticized to such an extent that they have, been, they have been turned into their opposite. I am pretty certain that if one could convince Fritz that this offers an opportunity to publish your theory in connection with his work and merge the two pieces, he would go along with anything, and you would be able to turn it into the essay we envisaged. Perhaps the essay could appear under both your names, which would surely be a matter of great satisfaction for Fritz. Adorno did admit, though, that it was hard to dismiss the argument that it would be a shame and uneconomical simply to omit your essay on state capitalism in such an issue. By your state socialism, Adorno meant Horkheimer's aforementioned essay on the authoritarian state, eventually published in the commemorative publication for Benjamin, which had originally borne the title Staatskapitalismus. This surely means that Horkheimer's essay on the authoritarian state is a much better source for the understanding of Horkheimer's and Adorno's approach to state capitalism than Pollock's flagship article on state capitalism in the studies. Horkheimer thereupon tried to impress on Pollock once again, this time in somewhat clearer language, though to little effect, the need to place greater emphasis on the entanglement and, ambigu and ambiguity of the phenomena, the crossover between the concepts, etc. He urged Pollock to revise the text so that it might all come across in a slightly less rigidly administrative manner. Adorno seems to have been slightly more successful in suggesting to Pollock, as he reported to Horkheimer, that he revised the final part of the essay on democratic state socialism by giving it the guise of questions and issues for future research. The intercalation of this protective device seems to me to be the only way to avoid embarrassing ourselves in the eyes of our friends by giving the impression that we endorse the that we endorse theses which simply cannot be endorsed what do you think in terms of the content he continued the crucial problem is does the tendency towards a crisis free command economy presented in the text really express the objective tendency of reality or does the current antagonistic state of affairs continue to preclude the notional purity of this construct in future too. I feel in no position genuinely to answer this question. My instinct is as follows. The truth, the truth of the concept lies in its pessimism, i.e. the view that the chances of domination in its immediately political guise being perpetuated are greater than those of getting out from under it. Wrong is the, optimi wrong is the optimism even for others. What is being perpetuated is not so much a stable and in some way rational state of affairs, but rather for the foreseeable future, a relentless succession of catastrophes, chaos and terror. But with that conversely, also a renewed chance of escape. Eventually Horkheimer wrote a rather longer preface than usual for the state socialism issue to place Pollock's article in the right context. Adorno certainly felt that Horkheimer had done an excellent job of solving the tactical challenge 
of ruling out the misunderstanding that Fritz's essay actually acknowledges the possibility of a non-antagonistic form of state capitalism, on the one hand, without making the slightest concession to the official Marxist optimism, on the other. Responding to the draft of the preface, Newman wrote to Horkheimer, You interpret Pollock's essay in a manner that renders it entirely harmless, so that it, the, the essay, entirely contradicts your interpretation of it. Anyone who reads Pollock's essay in your preface must conclude that you have misunderstood each other. I appreciate entirely why you have undertaken this reinterpretation. You want to avoid distancing yourself from Pollock. I think it would be much better to let the disagreements become apparent, rather than hiding them and suggesting to the uninitiated that the two directors of the Institute are talking past each other. In his response, Horkheimer assured Newman that, since my trust in your study of the economic processes in Germany is unlimited, I take your word for it that Germany in its current state comes nowhere close to being a form of state capitalism. On the other hand, I cannot shrug off Engels's opinion that society is heading towards such a state of affairs. Consequently, I have to assume that it is in all likelihood looming, and to my mind, this renders Pollock's construction a valuable basis for discussion, all its flaws notwithstanding. He added that he could only agree with everything that Newman had to say about the profound identity between the fascist state of affairs and its predecessors. Nor does the, state, nor does the story end there. Rolf Wiggershaus has pointed to Newman's essay on approaches to the study of political power, published in 1950. There, Newman explained that the Soviet Union presents a clear-cut marginal case where political power not only has made itself supreme, but has become the fount of whatever economic power positions exist. Adding that, had there been no war or had the Nazis been victorious, the Soviet pattern would have prevailed in Nazi Germany too. In short, he conceded that a primacy of politics was conceivable and that the, that, and that the momentum in Nazi Germany was indeed headed in that direction. Adorno, conversely, felt no compunction about praising Newman's behemoth to his students in 1968 as the most congruous socioeconomic account of fascism to date though admittedly this praise hinged principally on Newman's implicit appropriation of the racket theory. Newman, Adorno emphasized, had been superficial at, oh, hold on. Newman, Adorno emphasized, had demonstrated that the ostensible integration of society under National Socialism had been su superficial at best. In fact, under the mantle, the very thin mantle of the total state, an almost archaic and anarchic struggle between the various social groups had raged. Horkheimer's preface in the final issue of the Studies in Philosophy and Social Science. One might well argue then that Horkheimer's preface to the state socialism issue of the Studies in Philosophy and Social Science is the closest there is to an official contemporary, contemporaneous statement on fascism by the Frankfurt School especially since, Horkheimer's reinterpretation of Pollock's article aside, Newman too, who had characterized Pollock's essay on state socialism as contradicting the Institute's theory from beginning to end and signaling a departure from Marxism, expressly confirmed that I find the formulations excellent and fully agree with the first four and three quarter pages. The formulations are exemplary and I would not want to change them in any way. Given my earlier remarks about the critical theorist's preoccupation with the transition or qualitative leap between non-fascism and fascism, it will hardly come as a surprise that Horkheimer began his pre preface by explaining that the articles in this issue deal with some problems implied in the transition from liberalism to authoritarianism in continental Europe. Note also the reference to authoritarianism rather than fascism. He then went on to develop a typological juxtaposition of pre-modern society, implicitly, classical liberal capitalism, or as Adorno called it, competitive capitalism, monopoly capitalism, and state capitalism. Initially, he explained, 
Private industry consisted of numerous independent entrepreneurs who in each country competed with likewise independent trades and bankers for social power. The outcome of this struggle expressed itself in the relative size of the capital controlled by each of them. Dominion over men and things was distributed among the members of this diversified social group according to the rules of exchange. In contrast to the early modern absolute state that had gone before, power had become decentralized. It had been transform or transferred from relatively well-organized privileged bodies to the multitude of proprietors who possessed no other title than their wealth and their resolve to use it. The course of social production was the resultant of their respective business policies. The, sign the signorial ordinances of pre-modern society had been replaced by anonymous laws and autonomous institutions by economic, legal, and political mechanisms, which reflected the size and composition of the nation's industry. In the next phase, competition among independent entrepreneurs eventually culminated in the giant concerns of monopolist industry. Under their hegemony, competition assumed a different form. The urge to compete with equals within the nation declined, and with it the motive for increased investment and full employment. The great leaders of business and other avenues of social life found their peers only across the various national borders. Rivalry among equal powers shifted more and more to the international scene alone. At this point, Horkheimer moved beyond the predominantly economic line of argument, stressing that the transition affected culture as a whole. He then moved straight on to the advent of fascism, without offering any explanation as to how fascism related to monopoly capitalism. Would it not be a good idea, Adorno had asked after reading the draft of the preface, to say something explicit about the relationship between monopolism and fascism? I would be all the more in favor of a differentiation at this point because Kirchheimer's essay is far too crude in equating the two. One could do this in a very Hegelian way and conceive of fascism as monopolism that has come into its own. Through its totali totalization, monopolism develops the new quality of fascism. The total domination of the monopolies transforms economy and society because it is identical with the elimination of the very market previously dominated by the monopolies. Yet, evidently, Horkheimer was not convinced of the need to explain this transition. With the advent of fascism, then, dualisms typical of the liberalistic era, such as individual and society, private and public life, law and morals, economy and politics, have not been transcended but obscured. Individuals have become less and less independent of society, while society has fallen to the mercy of mere individual interests. With the decline of the individual moral feelings that stood against authoritarian law have lost their force, while authoritarian law has been entrusted to a perverted moral sense. Combining the state capitalism concept, racket theory and elements clearly prefiguring the notion of the administered world, Horkheimer continued by arguing that Rigid discipline, such as, ruled, such as ruled inside the factory, has now spread throughout the hinterland, borne forward by elites who, in their composition and function, have combined economy and politics. The leaders of industry, administration, propaganda, and the military have become identical with the state in that they lay down the plan of the national economy as the entrepreneur before them had laid down policy for his factory. The streamlined unconcern for material and ideal barriers shared by the rackets that had usurped the state and their need to defend their status against the claims of the generality did not, however, endow the ruling group with a real sol solidarity. To counterbalance their antagonism, no common faith exists. As among the medieval clergy, no belief in chivalry and princely blood as among the seigneur of absolutism. The unity of fascist leaders is cemented merely by their common fear of the people they tyrannize, by their dread of ultimate doom. In fact, the big industrialists attack the, f the furors for their expensive political apparatus. The furors' blood purge the underfurors because of their radical claims. The generals would like to get rid of all of them, 
The ruling clique, in short, does not become the dupe of its own ideologies. It shuffles them about freely and cynically according to the changing situation, thus finally translating into open action what modern political theory from Machiavelli and Hobbes to Pareto has professed. The next two sentences then read, These are the basic features of authoritarian society as it took shape after the debacle of European liberalism and most typically in Germany. Under National Socialism, the distribution of goods is carried on by private means. The competition has become even more one-sided than, than in the era of the 200 families. Evidently then, fascism, authoritarianism, and National Socialism could all be equated. This alone makes it very difficult to discern what Horkheimer assumed the dialectic of continuity and discontinuity to be in these developments. Did the debacle of European liberalism, for instance, mark a caesura or simply a stage in the logical progression of capitalism? That Horkheimer and his colleagues should not have been troubled by this lack of clarity, I would argue, only bears out my contention that the Frankfurt School did not see itself as engaging in the purest distillation of an essentialist concept of fascism, but was putting up a desperate fight to take on, both in conceptual and practical terms, and in the most pragmatic way they knew how, a host of evidently interrelated and deeply troubling developments. Intranational competition, Horkheimer continued, turns into oppression, as long as its power had been decentralized, he explained. Industry, propelled by its self-interest, had to cater to the needs of the population and willy-nilly promoted technical, political, and social progress at least to a certain degree. But under its, its totalitarian setup, big industry is in a position not only to impose its plan upon its former competitors, but to order the masses to work instead of having to deal with them as free parties to a contract. Popular needs determine production far less than they did through the market, and industry converges on the production of instruments of destruction. Having reiterated the notion of the elimination of the market that was crucial to the state capitalism concept, Horkheimer now moved squarely into dialectic of enlightenment territory. Planned waste of intelligence, happiness, and life, he continued, succeeds the, plan the planless waste caused by the frictions and crises of the market system. The more efficiently authoritarian planning functions and the more smoothly nature and men are exploited, the more are subjects and objects of a plan dominated by dead matter, and the more senseless, exorbitant, and destructive becomes the whole social apparatus, which is maintained for the perpetuation of power exclusively. All the rhetoric to the contrary notwithstanding, the blind calculative rationality of business life, so bitterly denounced by fascism, has carried over to the authoritarian society. In it, the previous irrational rationality of liberal capitalism had been replaced by madness with method. While genuine socialism would be characterized by a humankind that is conscious of its common good and solidarity and guides its own destiny under this so-called socialism, the natural conditions, the pressures of the masses, the rivalries of cliques play themselves off against each other in the sinister hearts of the furrers and emerge as the blind laws of fascist economy. To be sure, during the earlier periods of private industry too, the achievements of men turned increasingly against them. No masterpiece of engineering, no gigantic factory, no ladies' paradise arose without enhancing the power of society as well as, as, well as its misery. Now, however, in authoritarian society, technical, social, military advances are the handmaids of doom and disaster. Every frontier torn down by fascism only strengthens the walls separating men from each other. Every means of communication it improves only places them farther apart. Every scientific invention only blinds them the more to, the more to nature. Progress in the abstract triumphs. The world belongs to the clever and the devil take the hindmost. He continued and then added, this is true more than it ever was a formulation that surely epitomizes the intimate entanglement of continuity and discontinuity in Horkheimer's account. The soul of fascism, he went on, was the principle of letting nothing lie still, 
of stirring everyone to action, of tolerating nothing that has no utility in a word, dynamism. Moral taboos and ideals are abolished. True is that which is proved serviceable. What Horkheimer described in this instance as the soul of fascism would, of course, resurface in Dialectic of Enlightenment, as Horkheimer and Adorno's critique of the Enlightenment that had yet to develop a sense of its true purpose and power, and thus transcend its own limitations. Can anyone dare question the serviceability of the secret police, of concentration camps, blood purges against the insane, anti-Semitism, relentless anti-Semitism, relentless activization of the people. Horkheimer continued, Fascists have learned something from pragmatism. Even their sentences no longer have meaning, only a purpose. Fascism, he suggested, feels itself the sun, nay the savior of the world that bore it. That world, that world collapsed as Marx had prophesied, because after it had reached a certain point in its development, it was unable to fulfill human needs. Technological unemployment has evidenced the crisis which cannot be alleviated by returning to the market system. This would suggest that there was indeed no way back. National socialism attempts to maintain and strengthen the hegemony of privileged groups by abolishing economic liberties for the rest of society, he went on. Turning finally to the German people in general, Horkheimer suggested that in tolerating Hitler, they went along with the facts. Given the prevailing inequality and injustice, it was, politi it was politic to profit from the weakness of the old world powers and to supplant them. With the world as it was, Hitler seemed more practical than Stresemann. National Socialism became the diehard competitor on an international scale, and now, he concluded, the general section of his preface in a perhaps somewhat surprising twist. The question is whether the long-established houses can remodel their enterprises fast enough to get rid of it. Evidently then, fascism need not have the last word after all. Horkheimer then turned to Pollock's essay on state capitalism. Its topic was an authoritarian society that might embrace the earth, or one that is at least autarkic. Its challenging thesis is that such a society can endure for a long and terrifying period. Basing itself on the most recent economic experience, it comes to the conclusion that all technical economic problems that worried the business world can be handled through authoritarian devices. The article attempts to destroy the wishful ideas that fascism must eventually disintegrate through disharmonies of supply and demand, budget deficiency, or unemployment. That said, he clarified, the study is not confined to authoritarian society alone, but conceives the latter as a subspecies of state cap or of state capitalism, thus raising the question whether state capitalism might not be work workable within the framework of democracy rather than terror. Then followed the aforementioned positive remarks about U.S. democracy that had worried both Newman and Adorno. In the final short paragraph, Horkheimer relativized the significance of Pollock's essay by noting that it outlines the economic structure of state capitalism and emphasizing that the remaining articles in the issue study the links between authoritarian society and the past, as well as the disharmonies that dominate its existing form. Auschwitz Within about a fortnight, at most, of the publication of the final issue of the studies and the Institute's commemorative volume for Benjamin, the BBC broke the news of the German genocide against European Jewry to the wider public, though it seems unlikely that somebody who was as well informed and connected as heavily involved in trying to rescue Jewish relatives and associates from Europe as Horkheimer would not already have had a fairly good idea of what was going on. The impact of the Shoah on Horkheimer and Adorno is well documented. Not too surprisingly, it led them to take an even bleaker view of the direction in which the world seemed to be heading. They also became rather less forgiving in their assessment of the role of the German population. They now reasoned that the still very young history of fascism, or state capitalism, on its own could not possibly account for the endless series of inconceivably horrible deeds the most fiendish acts of organized murder and destruction ever accomplished by any people since the beginning of history, 
that were now being perpetrated by the German nation. This explicit reference to the German nation is indicative of a tension which, from the final years of the war onwards, characterized their assessment of fascism, national socialism, for a while. Confronted with the Shoah, the critical theorists became increasingly preoccupied, even more so, and especially more explicitly than before, specifically with German national socialism. On the one hand, while the, univer while the universalizing tendencies of the Dialectic of Enlightenment project also led them to worry very seriously about the possibility that fascism, after the, de after the defeat of Nazi Germany, would come to dominate the West in its entirety not least given the forces it would need to mobilize to fend off Soviet communism. This is what Adorno meant when he wrote in his letter to Horkheimer of May 9, 1945, that the historical force of fascism has moved its abode, and that the conflict between the two absolute tickets from which there will no longer be any escape is clearly looming. Ticket thinking featured prominently in the seventh of the of the elements of anti-Semitism, Horkheimer and Adorno added to the version of Dialectic of Enlightenment published in Amsterdam in 1947. They argued that there was a tendency for people no longer to make actual judgments and ideological choices. Instead, they increasingly bought into comprehensive ideological package deals in an effectively automated manner that corresponded to the, to the developmental phase of state capitalism. While many of their observations are compelling, the implications seem to be that this new mode of ticket thinking marked the universalization of anti-Semitism and hence fascism, though it arguably makes much more sense in the context of the administered world. Ultimately, what clearly emerged from dialectic of enlightenment, eclipse of reason, and the concept of the administered world was the enormous destruction of constantly wrought was the enormous construction or the enormous destruction constantly wrought on human life by modern society even when its potential for fascism was not realized after 1945 once it became clear not only that fascism was not in fact taking over the west but also that the development in many of the western countries might well be characterized by a previously unprecedented measure of liberal democratic governance and social redistribution, Horkheimer and Adorno, as far as I can see, conceptualized National Socialism as both an extreme case and as the dysfunctional other of the administered world. Take Adorno's suggestion of 1959 that National Socialism had anticipated the current mode of crisis management in a violent form. It had been a barbaric experiment in state control over industrial society. In an interview published posthumously nine days after his death in West Germany's foremost weekly news magazine, Der Spiegel, Horkheimer made the same argument. Fascism was the violent anticipation of the universally administered society. National socialism was, was unable to function seamlessly because the instruments for the domination of nature had not yet been perfected. Yet, in principle, National Socialism had already contrived a fully automated society, as it were, a society without morality and spirit. As long as the West remained more prosperous than the East, i.e. the countries in the Soviet sphere of influence, the fascist variant is more likely to appeal to the masses than the Eastern propaganda, while, on the other hand, one does not feel pressed to resort to the fascist ultima ratio, Adorno wrote in 1959. The formulations reflect the complex and potentially paradoxical dialectic they were trying to address. Strictly speaking, if fascism was the extreme case of the administered world, then the evolution of the then the evolution of the administered world needed to be stopped in its tracks before it could unfold its potential for fascism again. If, on the other hand, fascism was the dysfunctional other of the administered world, then the administered world needed to be defended against anything that might subvert it sufficiently to necessitate a return to fascism. Adorno's frequently misquoted statement that, I consider the afterlife of national socialism within democracy potentially more dangerous than the afterlife of fascist tendencies against democracy might suggest that, on balance, he was more worried about fascism as the extreme case 
of the administered world. On the other hand, remarks he made in the lecture theater in 1968 seemed to point in the opposite direction. In the same lecture in which he praised Newman's behemoth to his students as the most congruous socioeconomic account of fascism to date, he explained to them that he saw a fundamental dialectic at work in the ever more comprehensive integration of society. Adorno suggested to his students that increasing social integration as a visible phenomenon is generally accompanied by a tendency towards disintegration in the sense that the various social processes that are melded together, but for the most part stem from diverging sets of interests, instead of maintaining the measure of neutrality of relative indifference towards one another that was characteristic of earlier phases of social development, become more and more antagonistic towards one another. It seems to me that this is particularly evident, he added, in extreme situations in late bourgeois society like fascism. What then Adorno continued of the current situation, i.e. 1968. One of the potentially counterintuitive implications of the racket theory is that not ever increasing all-encompassing all social conformity and uniformity in state control is the precursor of fascism, but, but precisely its opposite the fundamental disintegration of society and the appropriation of state functions by competing rackets. Adorno therefore argued that the tendency he had previously described as coming to a head in fascism probably did not pertain to the more peaceful late bourgeois society of 1968, because the current pluralism we are constantly being told about was not so much reality as an ideological claim and the various parallel forces are in fact encaptured and integrally determined by the all-dominating social system under which we live. But very bluntly indeed, one might say, fascism was characterized by great disunity and thus talked all the more about unity, more peaceful late bourgeois society. By contrast, talked a great deal about pluralism and diversity, but was in fact profoundly integrated and streamlined. In short, it was the continued functionality of what Horkheimer, as we saw, described as a fully automated society without morality and spirit that vouched for the fact that society was not threatened by the sort of disintegration to which fascism might be seen as the solution. This account of fascism as both the extreme case and the dysfunctional other of the administered world renders no obvious way out and clearly points towards the continued need from metaphysics and theology or whatever one wants to call it. The legacy of the Frankfurt School's grappling with fascism, National Socialism, then, is the commitment to dealing with this app apparent paradox. We are tasked with pinpointing the potential for fascism wherever it shows itself, while at the same time adhering to the principle of determinate negation, and thus insisting on the very real differences between the potential for fascism and its actual realization. Adorno's new categorical imperative depends not only on a keen awareness of the fact that the objective social prerequisites that precipitated fascism continue to exist, but also on the appreciation of what Auschwitz actually was, in other words, of what was so unprecedented and singular about Auschwitz that the need to prevent its recurrence merits a new categorical imperative in the first place. The facile lumping together of distinct phenomena or their indeterminate negation across the board amounts not to a realization of this categorical imperative, but demeans it and obstructs its implementation. The black outlook notwithstanding, on which we were always in agreement, Adorno wrote in his letter to Horkheimer on May 9, 1945. There are grounds for joy all the same, on the one hand because in a world that topples from one catastrophe to another, even a short reprieve is a joy. On the other hand, because the utmost dread was still called Hitler and Himmler, and while it could recur elsewhere, it is not done so, yet. Things turned out better than you thought this time, and maybe they will also turn out better than both of us think in the future.